Tom, thanks for joining us on Dental Talk. Phil, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And uh, you did a tremendous webinar last night, actually. We got over a 1,000 people on board for that, and it was a huge success. So if anybody's interested in tapping into that, visit vivalearning.com and check out Tom Viola's webinar on uh, Xerostomia. It's, uh, it was really, really well done if you're, if you're interested in learning about all the ramifications of dry mouth. And this podcast, we're going to learn some stuff as well. So let's begin with my first question, which is, I, I've heard that xerostomia is really a subjective sensation of a dry mouth, often associated with salivary gland hypofunction. What are your thoughts on this? So xerostomia is indeed subjective. It's, it's just a feeling of dry mouth, but it may not necessarily be associated with true salivary gland hypofunction. So medications, for example, can make your mouth dry by decreasing the saliva production itself, but there's nothing wrong with the glands. The glands are just being, you know, told not to produce saliva through the, usually through an autonomic nervous system response. Once the medication clears from the body, normal saliva production returns. So while xerostomia is very subjective, true salivary gland hypofunction is objective and something we can both test for and treat, and therefore, of course, uh, in turn, treat xerostomia. Yeah, so how pervasive is dry mouth among our patient population, and is this a condition we as clinicians should be concerned about across all age groups, or is this primarily focusing on the elderly? Good question, Phil. You know, it's funny, even the American Dental Association in their oral health topics uh, published uh, in July of 2019 said that uh, because of imprecise uh, calculations due to limited data, they're not really sure if the incidence of xerostomia is either 0.9% or up to 64.8%. So how's that for a range of... Yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> evading the question as far as, yeah, that statistic. So what does that mean? What, what does that actually mean then? It just it points to the, what we talked about before, that xerostomia is indeed subjective. And unfortunately, it, we really do need to look into what to, un, un, what's the underlying cause of the xerostomia. Is it in, indeed SGH? Is it salivary gland hypofunction? Which is easy to test for and easy to, to treat, but the problem is bringing the people to treatment. A lot of people get dry mouth and just treat it themselves, you know, just drink more water, sip water all day. And it, until it really becomes a problem for them, they don't really take much action. However, that's where we have a great role as dental clinicians because we can point out that the damage xerostomia does to the oral cavity, to the teeth and the tissues is something that needs to be addressed and therefore raise it from just a minor inconvenience to an actual disease state that needs to be treated. And, and when does the clinician make that decision, chair side, that this is a disease state and it's not just subjective regarding the patient's perception of whether they have dry mouth or not, which is xerostomia, but they're actually, you know, under the condition of salivary gland hypofunction, which, which is detrimental to their, to their dentition and also hurts treatment plans, long-term success of treatment plans. How, how do, where is that line drawn where they can make that decision and what do they do? So it's the initial presentation, you know, is, is, and I, we talked about that in the, in the webinar last night. Is there a pool of saliva in the floor of the mouth where there should be? Is there a change to the consistency of the saliva? Is it more thick? Is it more ropey? Uh, is there just an a obvious sign of xerostomia, meaning an obvious sign of, of just not enough saliva to coat the tissues, to coat the teeth? Uh, have there been a loss of pillay to the tongue? These are things that a trained uh, dental clinician can pick, on, pick up on rather easily and just ask the patient, you know, do you have a dry mouth? Do you have trouble swallowing food unless you moisten it? Do you have trouble during the day where you feel like you need to constantly sip water because you feel like you have this dry mouth? But the greater point here is that salivary gland hypofunction can be a sign of some other underlying or pre-existing condition. So by identifying and treating salivary gland hypofunction, we can also perhaps identify and maybe help with the diagnosis of other related diseases. Yeah, and talking about that, which organ system diseases and illnesses may actually contribute to and exacerbate the complications of xerostomia? Well, cardiovascular disease is certainly number one, not only because the disease itself can limit the heart's function to pump fluid throughout the body and thereby lead to less saliva, but also the medications used to treat cardiovascular disease often involve causing some type of dehydration or a decrease in, in fluid output from the kidneys. 
So that's one right off the bat. And right behind it is respiratory disease because respiratory disease, not only, again, disease itself sort of fosters mouth breathing, right, because it's easier to, to take breaths in and out through the mouth. But again, the medications that can use to treat respiratory disease can you know, cause or exacerbate existing xerostomia. Oh, then right behind that is diabetes. I mean, I'm, I'm, got, I'm going right down the list here. You know, diabetes, and, and again, due to neuropathy, due to damage to the nerves that innervate the salivary glands, um, and, and resulting or, you know, potentially resulting renal disease from diabetes, which, again, can limit fluid uh, homeostasis in the body. Yeah, and you went through this in great detail on the webinar, which, which you know, is very important for clinicians to identify these particular uh, organ diseases that are that are directly um, attributable t to dry mouth. Um, now, is this mostly these medications that patients are taking for some of these systemic diseases? Is it mostly the medications that affect the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? Are those the medications we have to be most concerned about, or or is there other uh, other ways that these medications work that will also cause uh, the dry mouth syndrome? It's part of it, Phil. So, so we've got medications that definitely impact the sympathetic and parasympathetic and can increase or, or decrease both the serous and mucinous saliva, uh, changing the consistency of the saliva, changing the, the quantity and the quality of the saliva. Uh, and that would be uh, to your question from before about all different age groups because children can take medications for anxiety, depression, ADHD, and that can limit their salivary flow. Uh, right up to the elderly, the geriatric population, where, again, they take multiple medications, and, and they also, uh, because we're taking medications that each cause xerostomia, when they use combined or concomitantly, can increase the risk. But, again, sympathetic and parasympathetic aside, there's a whole bunch of other medications, like drugs to treat cardiovascular disease that cause fluid depletion, and, again, drugs that are used to treat the respiratory illness that can decrease uh, saliva production and therefore increase the risk of opportunistic infection, especially steroids. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, radiation therapy for cancer uh, therapy cool. would obviously deteriorate the, the activity of the, of the salivary glands. So what are some of the products that clinicians can recommend to their patients that can help minimize the discomfort of dry mouth and increase the moisture in the oral cavity? Well, there are four products I always talk about when I talk about xerostomia, and it's only because I have the most experience with them that I mention them. I'm sure there are others, uh, but I just happen to like these four because, again, I've, I've seen them used more often. And, of course, Sunstar's product, the Gum Hydral, the Dry Mouth Relief, is an amazing product because it contains the hyaluronic acid and the PVP. Those two things are, are exceptional lubricants and also protectants, but you know, hyaluronic acid also has a humectant quality to it as well. So it's fluid retaining and lubricating at the same time. And then you've got the PVP that's also a protectant because it forms a nice film around the oral mucosa and the tissues. So I think the hydrol products are amazing, uh, and, and they're, they're easily uh, used almost every day or even multiple times a day if necessary. Again, biotine has always been the sort of the industry leader, and, and biotine has its own ingredients that help uh, for lubrication and protection. Uh, but th their products are, are different in, in what they contain. So most of it's glycerol, which is a moisturizer, uh, sorbitol, which is a humectant on its own, again, to draw moisture in, and propylene glycol, which is both a humidifier and an emulsifier. So it... it helps saliva surround food particles and surround things in the mouth and, and helps you know, clear debris from the oral cavity. So, again, biotin, again, been around forever, and it's got a good formula. I, I, between, you know, me and the lamp post on the street, I happen to like the hydrol products a little better because the formulation seems to be much more conducive to lubricating and protecting the oral cavity. On the, on the pharmacologic side, you know, th those things that would maybe require a prescription, um, I do like the, the supersaturated calcium phosphate solution, uh, Nutrisal or Salivamax, because it, it adds, obviously, calcium and phosphate, which is what we need to promote remineralization. And I like stannous fluoride. I've always had like stannous. It seems like we went from stannous to sodium back to stannous again. Uh, stabilized stannous is certainly uh, uh, what we're, where we're headed uh, lately. And, again, I think the Crest... Uh, ProHealth uh, does a good job in their gum insensitivity toothpaste because it provides the fluoride, but it contains betaine, 
uh, which uh, the hydrol product also contains. And betaine is both a humectant, but it also reduces sensitivity, which is important in patients with xerostomia because their tissues are, are raw, friable, and, and so we want to try to protect the tissues, but also decrease the sensitivity as well. Yeah, so regarding the hydro, which you mentioned you like, that's an over-the-counter. So they could go right. into Walgreens or any of these types of retail stores and, and purchase that without a prescription, correct? Correct, yep. Of course, I think we'd like it if it was, if it was recommended by their healthcare or a healthcare provider, but certainly they could buy it after that on their own, which makes easy access. Absolutely. Right, and at what point does the clinician decide, okay, I have to prescribe something? The general dentist, the, uh, the general practitioner, they don't have a ton of experience with this. Are they the ones to make that decision to prescribe, or does an oral medicine doctor do it? Who actually does that? That's a good question, Phil, because it can be both. And I, I think while a general practitioner... Uh, would probably venture or at least dip a toe in the water. A lot of them uh, lately, in, in my experience, have just referred them to general dentists for a routine follow-up or, or, or a hygienist for routine follow-up. Uh, in my opinion, I think it should be us. It should be the dental clinicians because we can make the call, okay, let's start with the non-pharmacologic treatments, you know, the things that you can buy over the counter. And if those don't work or there's obviously serious signs of demineralization or impact on the, on the dentition, then move to something like stannous fluoride or the supersaturated calcium phosphate. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely a good way to go. Start off with the, the least invasive type uh, medication. And does the general dentist have to communicate with the physician when they make that prescription? Or is that something they can do independently? I would hope so. Not necessarily. I think a lot of times it's a referral situation, but I, I would hope that there's some collaboration because, again, we're treating xerostomia, right? We're treating salivary gland hypofunction. But going back to what we talked about before, is it systemic illness that's compounding the problem? Because maybe working hand-in-hand -hand with the general practitioner, we can figure out, okay, is it the disease state or the medications used to treat that disease state? And can we alter therapy to achieve the same outcome with the disease state but at the same time, reduce the risk of the xerostomia or the salivary gland hypofunction. Yeah, that, that's uh, very insightful. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Tom so, is a brilliant, brilliant guy when it comes to, uh, well, he's a brilliant guy anyway, not, not only when it comes to pharmacology, but when it comes to pharmacology, he certainly is. So look him up. You can Google Tom Viola, V-I-O-L-A. Uh, he's known for his uh, educational program, Pharmacology Declassified. Please check that out. And if you're watching the video of this, you'll see it in the background in his studio. And we really appreciate your insight, Tom. We hope to have you on future podcasts and webinars. And if you want more information on Hydral and other products that, that Tom talked about, you can visit Sunstar and um, you can look up the other products that he mentioned. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Phil.